audience. Hello, Patrick. Let's see. Oh, let's stand. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Before I start, I want to say, audience, there is a poll open for you. So go ahead and uh, oh, Nicole, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about the results in a few minutes. So uh, while we do the introductions, audience, go check out the poll and let us know where you're calling from in the chat. We love to hear from you. Um, thank you so much for joining me here today, Patrick. And Stan, I'm so pumped about this event and the key takeaways that our audience will get out of um, this. Uh, but first, let me do a quick um, icebreaker with my speakers just to make sure. Uh, hey, Philip, uh, is it better now? Is my audio better now? Yeah, great. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you for letting me know. Uh, so let's do a quick icebreaker with the speakers just to make sure that everyone feels comfortable and it gives our audience a few minutes to join. Uh, I want to ask Stan first, if you can describe your mood as a weather forecast, what would that be? I would say uh, anything during football season is what I like. So fall weather, 75 to 85 degree weather. We get the true four seasons in Utah, which is where I live. Uh, but anything related to fall is my jam. That sounds good. So uh, you're thriving now because you're getting there. At least here in New York City, it's pretty cold and uh, yeah. fall weather already. Uh, what about you, Patrick? What will be your weather for forecast as a mood? Yeah, I live in Seattle, Washington now. I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. And I think um, in, in Cleveland, my, uh, my personality, my, my type would be prepared for anything. Uh, I think if, if you're from the Midwest and particularly like Cleveland, Pittsburgh area, you know, that weather could change at the drop of a hat from snowing to hail to sunshine, uh, all, all in, all in a span of a few hours. So that's, that's my style. Maybe. Awesome. So it's very moody. It changes a lot. No, no, I, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Got to be yeah, converse there. I'd say I'm prepared for it, so I'm going. That's good. That that's a better way to look at it. Awesome, audience. If you can go ahead on the chat and tell us also what will be your weather forecast as your mood today. Um, while I do my introductions in here. So we are here to talk about how to master sales commissions, ally, motivate, and retain your. Um, your staff. My name is Eduardo. I am a community events manager at Mob and Sales Pros. And for those of you not familiar with MSP, we are the world's largest and highest quality community for those in sales management, sales leadership, sales and revenue operations, sales enablement, aka our modern sales pros. A lot of sales in my phrases here. Um, our mission is to create an environment for our members to answer the toughest revenue questions out there. And we do that uh, through uh, live sessions like this one you're about to experience. We always have amazing speakers. Thank you, Patrick and Stan, for being here today. Uh, we also have a robust online forum where you can go uh, ask questions and also answer questions. Um, and we have quarterly summits. I'm going to talk about our upcoming summit in a few minutes. Uh, and we are getting back to in-person events, which is very exciting. Um, so if you're not part of the MSP uh, community, yeah, you will receive an email uh, inviting you to join us right after this um, event. And as I said, we have quarterly summits. And we are getting ready to, um, to get the best uh, sales leaders out there for you. So I just put a link in the chat here for you audience to join us in during the summit. You can hear from uh, sales leaders at Gong, Cowboy Ventures, uh, sales, um, sales Loft, Spacket, Gainsight, and also Spiff. Spiff is going to be there. So don't miss out. It's going to be an amazing event. Um, Enough about other events. Let's talk about how to get the most out of this one. So first, this event is being recorded. Uh, you will be able to access the recording and key takeaways later today. I'll send a follow-up email with everything that you need. And also, I was talking with my speakers backstage, and they were saying, like, they really love answering questions. So let's shower them with questions today to make sure that they have the energy to finish up the week. Um, Awesome. And the best thing about MSP, I left it for now, is that we have amazing partners. And today we are partnering with Spiff. I have Stan here with me. Stan, uh, before you introduce yourself, can you introduce us to the amazing job that uh, your team at Spiff is doing? Yeah, thanks, Eduardo. And uh, glad that we could sponsor this event. But Spiff is a, a modern and leading sales compensation pl platform that really automates uh, really any commission calculation. Uh, but from simple to complex uh, that drives and motivates teams to excel and really drive that top line growth. 
Awesome, we love having Spiff as a partner. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more, there's a button at the top of this page to request a demo with the Spiff team. Um, all right, so let's get things rolling. I have those two amazing speakers here with me today. Um, since uh, we already heard from Stan, Stan, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your experience. Yeah, I, I would first say that uh, hopefully this doesn't sound like fool's gold, but I. I work with a lot of experts around comp and have for over two decades. Uh, so I've been very uh, fortunate to work with some really smart people from RevOps, sales ops, finance, and sales leadership in general. And I've been just really lucky to work with these folks that have helped drive the kind of comp plan that uh, is needed. And I really love this topic because I, I kind of feel like I'm a jack of all trade, master of none when it comes to, to comp. I've seen really great, I've seen not so great. Uh, so it's, I think, a really valid topic, especially with the, you know, many of us going into the calendar year uh, or a new fiscal, whatever your fiscal starts uh, in 2024. So uh, I've been around for, like I mentioned, a couple of decades selling B2B SaaS. Uh, so I've worked with some really large organizations and have seen uh, how comp structure works there. And I've worked, uh, you know, the, I've been in the top 20 employees at a startup. So seen a little bit of a variety and just really uh, glad that we can have this conversation. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. And we also have Patrick from Twilio here. Patrick, can you introduce uh, yourself and tell us a little bit about your experience? Sure. Thanks, Eduardo. <clears throat> yeah, my experience, um, I would consider myself very similar. I'm, I'm a go-to-market architecture nerd. Uh, I, I've, I've done anything from SMB sales with large private yellow page companies early in my career selling digital solutions to consulting seed round stage to being a part of series b series c and now with twilio a large public company as well so uh, any question that you have on any stage company I'm, I'm happy to kind of share my perspective and, and some guidance here today awesome i'm pretty sure the audience will send us a lot of questions so let's look at the poll let me close it here and uh, put on the screen. So people said that uh, the biggest challenge uh, their organization faces when it comes to sales commission structures is balancing short-term rewards with long-term goals. What do you guys think about it? Is it surprising? What do you think, Stan? Yeah, I don't think it's surprising at all. I think that, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about the structure and the, and the tee up for a successful uh, overall strategy around comp, but there is that quarterly, monthly, kind of in between to really motivate and drive reps to, you know, do a thing, so to speak. And this, um, Patrick and I were talking a little bit about this earlier, where it's not just salespeople, just really any commissionable uh, user could be uh, short or long term. So I think, you know, I think of an example of, um, you know, you have like a business development rep or team where uh, you're, we rolled out, for example, a new named account strategy, and we really wanted to get alignment in pods. And so we created a, a contest to drive alignment. It could be that simple. Uh, the contest could be as simple as $500 where the top team or top top three teams that drive X amount of, of meetings uh, from an AESDR perspective. So there are different ways to approach it. And I think alignment with uh, the leadership team, cross-functional and within each department, I think really factors into the success of this. Awesome. Yeah, that's a good, uh, good take. I, I would say there's also, a, it's okay to have a healthy tension between comp levels. So AEs often are paid monthly, right? Um, many times you have quarterly results that you're trying to drive. And at the highest level, your C levels may have annual targets. Those uh, healthy tensions are actually, uh, it's actually a good thing. And there's some ways to manage that. But I, I got to think the North Star for the company needs to be your, your compensation plan. Like Stan just mentioned, uh, maybe you can run some SPIFs, SPIF, Sales Performance Incentive Fund. I'm not a huge fan of that. Um, because I think if you get your sales comp plan right, then the rest of it should fall in line. But if you have these strategic things, these shifts, maybe you pivoted because of COVID, maybe you pivot because of AI, um, then often, you, I think we'll dive more into this, though, um, you do need to be flexible and nimble to change your comp plan. But you can lead with the front, like Stan just said, with some of these contests uh, to get people rallied around some central concept. 
Awesome. Uh, thank you everyone for answering the poll. Let me close it right now. Uh, we are about to uncover how sales commissions can not only boost your bottom line, but also become your tool for growth, as Patrick and Stan already said, and motivate your teams. Um, so let's start with the planning. Let's start from the beginning. Stan, uh, you've been quite vocal about the importance of aligning compensation with company objectives. Uh, can you shed some light on this, especially as we look at um, the planning for 2024? Yeah, no, as I was preparing for, for this uh, discussion, when I think about a, a business uh, or comp sales comp aligning to business objectives, just at a surface level, it sounds really simple. It's an easy conversation to have. You can have it at a 5,000 foot view, at a 10,000 foot view, but in practice, it's really hard. And I think Patrick hit it on the nail. If you do it right, it should drive the right behavior. And so I, and it just in my experience, uh, there are just some things that I've learned personally that uh, I've always prescribed to wherever I've gone and, and however I've worked with uh, with others to drive the right strategy and collaboration. And ultimately, really, it's for me, it's alignment. And so when I think about uh, those key factors, first and foremost, someone's got to own it. Someone needs to be a QB. And in my experience, I have been the QB and others I have not. Sometimes in a large organization, it's rev ops, sales ops. If you're everybody uh, that, that, that we have on this call is likely at a different growth stage. Patrick had talked about experience with B, C and C potentially. I've, I've been those as well. And usually in the earlier rounds, it uh, is most often the sales leader. In the later rounds, you have more resources. And sometimes that could be finance as well, but just kind of depends on where you are as a business. But someone needs to own it. And then the real key thing uh, right after that, in my opinion, is a steering committee. And that could include some of your key sellers as well. It's being able to understand what are the uh, the, the key factors uh, to drive the right outcome that align to the business objectives. Uh, and I also think now is the time. Like all, a lot of us are on a calendar start. Uh, and when that happens, now is the time to start thinking about it and starting to create those deliverables. You know, some of us have, you know, the, the, the key factor, which is revenue, the North Star, right? We're all trying to grow. Um, in in a, an A, B, C, you're probably a triple, double type growth mm -hmm. pattern if you're moving fast and others aren't moving as fast. So it kind of depends on the industry you're in and, you know, the commissionable user. Uh, it could be customer success. It could be an MBO kind of plan. It could just there's and then there's different models, right? There's a bookings model and there's a consumption model. And all of those things factor into how we align. And that communication is just critical. So the North Star for a a plan would be, again, who owns it? And usually the person that raises their hand in the earlier stage is usually the one that owns it. Uh, your steering committee, uh, and then a good amount of time and buffer to have a good amount of healthy debate and discussion around it, uh, making sure that you know plans are early. And most of the companies that I've uh, worked with, I could tell you some of the plans came out mid-year. And you can imagine how frustrating that is for those administering the plans and to the reps that don't really know what that North Star is. It's just a flaw. And, and, and I've been part of that. I've been, in some cases, owner of that. And I will attest to that. But I just, these are the things that I've learned and have gotten better just having been at some of these uh, earlier stage companies. After uh, you have an established uh, and prioritization of, of, of what those goals are, uh, I really think also it's important to really have an understanding and, and a definition around your metrics. One of the, the most underutilized metrics that I really didn't start thinking about using until probably later is the compensation cost of sales. And uh, the Alexander Group has a really cool uh, read. If you haven't, uh, if, if you just looked up the Alexander Group and the compensation cost of sales, they have a benchmark on how to uh, approach it. And it was around you know 8%. And it gives you a pretty good idea on how, how to approach it. And then I think Patrick hit this on the on the nail at the, on the at the last one is once you have your strategy and your 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 alignment, you start building. But it, once it's built, you got to be ready to iterate. Like no comp plan is is likely not going to change. And I think we all that have been when we went through COVID, we all saw the impact of that. So we just have to set that expectation as a leadership team, as a steering committee to be ready to pivot and change as the market conditions uh, apply. So those are kind of the key things that, that I think about when I process internally preparing to, to create a build out of a plan 
uh, to align with the business objectives. Stan, I'm, I'm curious. I want to piggyback on that. Like in that steering committee or, or, or buying group committee, whatever, whatever you frame it, you have this decision criteria. Have you ever heard from maybe somebody in finance or, or your CEO that says, man, this sounds awfully expensive. Like we're going to be paying reps a lot. How would you how would you talk to that? Oftentimes, uh, I, as a good salesperson, I layer. What do you mean that by that? Tell me what a lot means to you. Usually uh, a good comp plan, I, I think about, and this is maybe, I love that question because I do think even before the start of a build, your philosophy on how you pay factors. As a business, do you want to be in the top 75th percentile? Is that just how you as a business function? Or are you, a, you know, you're a startup, you, maybe funds aren't plentiful and you need to figure out total compensation, which could be maybe a, a smaller OTE, but a factor of equity and other type benefits. So I do think uh, kind of depends is my answer uh, to the question. But I, I do think if I get uh, a question from a CEO or a finance person, that seems costly. I kind of look at the metrics. If it's available, I look at the historicals. What type of revenue did we we produce? And then I got to look at that, the compensation cost of sales metric and other metrics to help me understand, well, if we pay here and we get the kind of output that we had last year and, and what we need to do if we're doubling in size this year, uh, more cowbell. Awesome. Thank you. We have a question already from Nicole. Uh, they're asking, do you suggest setting an annual compensation plan with on target earnings when you have a longer sales cycle? Uh, I would say, yeah, if you have a longer sales cycle, right, you're usually selling to enterprise. You're probably talking about ARR versus MRR, right? So I, I do think a number of things need to be in consideration from when you're hiring folks, talking about that ramp, setting a realistic ramp plan. Do you pay a draw or not for some of those longer sales cycles? Uh, an annual comp plan is a little bit harder to achieve. Like maybe you have to pay some uh, so maybe it's 50, maybe it's 80% of a draw to somebody, maybe it's hundred percent. I, I do think you need to reward people. Um, but then again, you, you kind of have to trust, but trust, but verify, uh, to Stan's point earlier about MBOs, are the reps doing the right activities historically that will lead to the outcome that you're seeking as a business. And so if, if you can reward for those activities in the short term, um, and not have all that big payout as a lump sum at the end, you, you may find better motivation of the team. Um, and it may just be better overall alignment. I don't know, Sam, what's, what's your take on a big, long sales cycle, enterprise sales paying off, you know, over time versus paying in, in at, at the very end? I think it's challenging, but. Yeah, I, I, I every company is a little bit different. Most of the, uh, but there's a little bit of latency, uh, I think with the camera, Patrick, you look like you're talking, but it, uh, at least in my view, and I wonder if it's my camera. Um, yeah, the video is a little delayed. <laughs> is, is, is am I am I real time, Eduardo? Everything you are you are real time, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, I, I I think it does depend greatly in in terms of the uh, the business use case. So it, I've been at companies where we've had a uh, hundred and you know twenty five like more transactional where they've been less than sixty days. Uh, they've been longer sales cycles, or they've been a half a year. Some in some cases they've been more than nine months. And in every situation, the goal would be is to leverage uh, your comp plan in a way where you can help accelerate that in a way where the comp plan helps you be more effective. It helps drive more productivity, better outcomes, faster cycles. I mean, as sales leaders, we're all trying to find a path to shorten the sales cycle uh, and increase uh, the ARR output for uh, each of our businesses. And so I would say that, you know, that kind of goes to with the initial comp structure, you know, what you think is, is truth at the beginning may, may pivot based on what you're seeing and the, the, the knobs that we're turning throughout the year to drive the, the kind of acceleration that we're looking for. But in a recent example, uh, we it took about six months to ramp. And so we had certain incentives in place where uh, it was more of a pipeline objective out of the gates to, to hit certain uh, metrics. And then at the six month mark uh, is when we started uh, driving it. And we I personally am not a fan of an annualized goal. I, I like it for President's Club, but that's about it. I like quarterly because it, it reduces, it normalizes the revenue distribution throughout the year, where uh, if it's an annualized kind of goal, uh, you're probably going to have a hockey stick like most of us in a traditional calendar uh, have seen where you have 35 to 45% of your revenue coming in. And that 
that's hard because if you're a sales leader and you've got a goal and you have 435, 45, maybe in some cases more at the end of the year, that's a lot of stress on, on a team and on you as a leader uh, to be able to perform. Uh, and so I personally prescribe to, even in an enterprise cycle, uh, I prescribe to a more quarterly objective, but have a, an annual president's club concept uh, that everyone can attain. So one little add on to that is on the quarterly perspective, I like accelerators uh, on a quarterly basis. Uh, to really kind of drive the normalization up in the quarter by quarter. So, I, Patrick, what are your thoughts? What have you seen? Well, I, I would even take it back a step farther to it sounds like that question is maybe the go to market motion they have alignment is probably new biz hunters and then some form of people who do account management or success and own the account. Um, perhaps you should consider a full sale, a, a full cycle sales rep. Maybe there's some element of I have this book of business that I'm managing today, and maybe there's a revenue target built into that. And I get some sort of commission for selling new business. Now, if that's too distracting or if that's not the goal of the business, you're in this hyper growth and you've, you've fully differentiated new versus existing, um, then, then there is some expectations in the hiring process that need to be set too. And if you set it up properly that that, that, that person is stable financially, like Stan said, maybe in the beginning of the plan, you can orient towards certain MBOs. And then later on, you go towards that more commissionable revenue model. I, I think it just it all comes down to the strategy that you set and kind of the goals for the business. That's why, again, back to the beginning, the, that goal alignment at the highest level needs to be very clear and, and aligned on what metrics we care about. Um, and in those longer sales cycles, there, there are some trade offs that the reps have. But that's why sales reps are paid well uh, is, you know, once they do get those big deals, those big new logos in, then the payoff is there for them. And I think that's important just to set expectations and, and kind of start from the beginning. Yeah, I think transparency is a good uh, good word to use in there, right? In this planning, uh, Patrick, you're talking about a little bit uh, uh, to about uh, motivation, right? Right. That's why they're paid well. Uh, and motivation and sales they go hand in hand, right? Uh, how have commissions strategies evolved, especially like post COVID and now that we have AI? How how you seen uh, those changes in the commission commission plans? Well, I know one of the things I was working in a series C company during the mid midst of COVID and, and we had some big changes that we had to need. We needed to make all at once. We were revamping the org and specifically going up market. So we we're having much longer sales cycles, much larger deals. We actually removed accelerators at the time and, and kind of evened out the curve for people and paid a flat rate. We actually paid people 10 percent, which is industry average for commission rates on ARR. We then added in kickers in, like above plan items for multi-year deals, maybe attaching services. Um, but because of the uncertainty, we didn't really know, like we didn't want to penalize reps too bad, but we still wanted to reward them. But we also wanted to be mindful of reducing enterprise risk for the business. Um, if, if a big contract did hit, we didn't want to capsize and exceed that 8% uh, Alexander Group metric that, that, Stan, that Stan put out there. So uh, it wasn't super popular, but when we explained to the reps why, the reps were all shareholders in that company. They all had RSUs, right? So there is a trade-off in this went back to the total comp conversation. Okay, every deal you bring in, regardless of if you're under or over, there's not gonna be some acceleration curve. Instead, you're gonna get paid a fair rate and we're gonna weather the storm and, and we're gonna be flexible. Maybe next quarter, we're gonna change it, but we're always gonna have both, both parties at, at, at mind. The, the AEs who are here to drive new business, but also the business itself needs cash flow to continue on. So we need to be careful about both those things. And that was at a, at a smaller company um, that was kind of weathering a storm during COVID. That may be a much different example than for a large cash laden uh, SaaS company like I work for with Twilio right now. We're in a much different position. Um, so that that probably wouldn't fly to remove accelerators. But maybe some level of changing those metrics or, or, or again, I, I said earlier, I'm not a huge fan of, of, of SPIFs. Uh, I'm a fan of SPIF, the company, but the terms, if, you know, the in, in, in these little rewards, these contests, these quarterly uh, contests we put out there, that may be a different additional layer that you can say, OK, we understand that the economics of the business may be evolving. Let's still supplement your comp plan with some sort of contest that drives reps towards, OK, here's the new vision for the company. Let's put this in place now. Know that the executive team in that comp committee is working on something more or long term. I, I don't understand. Did you have to go through anything like that with any of your companies recently or or with the new AI way of happening? Yeah, uh, nothing AI specific, but uh, definitely have to 
uh, pivot uh, in many ways on overall comp structure. I think just I was thinking as you were talking about a couple scenarios where there, there are certain ways to drive the kind of behavior you're looking for. The comp client is not the end all, first and foremost. I think as, as sales leaders and frankly, uh, frontline managers, I think I, I want to just talk about that for a second, because oftentimes with strategy, when you have alignment, you're trying to drive a behavior. The frontline managers are where the rubber meets the road, in my, in my opinion. Uh, so you have a plan, you execute on the plan, and, and the frontline managers are so pivotal and change. And I was thinking about, you know, the, the kind of accelerators that some of us add to our, uh, our deals, our partner, our plans. It could be, uh, Patrick mentioned multi-year, it could be annual upfront uh, payment, it could be multi-year upfront payment, it could be a whole host of things. And what I've seen is uh, if as a business you standardize, you show them what good is, sometimes that can be coached and managed too. So for example, we uh, at a past company had uh, a monthly, quarterly, kind of 50% of our deals were, uh, actually 60% of our deals were, deals were monthly and annual. And the only thing we did is we just said, this is what standard looks like, meaning annual upfront, three year and net 30. Very, that's a, this is a standard deal. We, we pushed our price book to it uh, to show them what they could discount with those scenarios. We didn't need to add that to the comp plan. Uh, and we ended up moving from uh, 60% uh, from uh, annual or excuse me, quarterly and monthly to 80% annual by just changing that behavior by managing through it. And so uh, I think there are different levers that, that we as sales leaders can pull and as executives, we could pull to be able to change the behavior. I, I do think ultimately the comp plan is what drives everyone to the North Star, which is the revenue metrics. But uh, again, there are different ways as a business we can pivot to, to promote change. Awesome. We have a question here um, from Jason. Jason is asking, on the quarterly perspective, would it be uh, cumulative, meaning you can make up a quarter if the goals are missed and the incentive not paid? Thank you. I was going to ask you if you could show the question. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, Patrick, do you want to answer that? I have a perspective. You might be more of an expert with this overall, but I could share what we did. Um, I, I can see both sides, meaning you, you can make up a quarter next quarter or there's some carryover. I, I think I think that could play. I, I also think for your reps are, are, are performing that may be un unfair, that may be unequitable for the reps that have over overperformed. I, I, don't, I, I would make sure that you're, again, balancing the objective. OK, on average, 60, in some cases, high growth companies have 70 percent of plans, uh, reps making making their plan, right, making that quota. So you should also be clear about, OK, are only 30 or 40 percent of people getting that quarter of the number? Maybe the number is not right. Maybe we need to reset it. Are, are, are the majority of people overachieving? Are you hitting that 60 percent mark? Well, you probably should probably should keep it. Um, I, I don't know, Stan, Stan, if you have a comment on that, but th there's a couple ways you would want to look at it and benchmark that before you would make make that move to say, OK, there's some carryover rollover quarter to quarter. Yeah, I, 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 I do think that there's uh, certainly I've seen plans where they carry it over. But mostly what I've seen is, uh, you know, make the uh, accelerators based on the quarterly perspective, because you want to, again, avoid lumpiness uh, in, in, in most of the cases that I've been in. I'd prefer the quarterly acceleration, but then give them the capabilities of being able to recover on, a, on an annual perspective and then give them the acceleration if they do that then. But uh, but generally, I, I, I don't see the rollover happen as much just in the businesses I've been. And I actually totally agree with Patrick on uh, if if there's a low attainment percentage, there's there's something bigger going on there that needs to be addressed. Yeah, and I would say we have this notion in, in sales that reps can sandbag deals and hold one deal over from a quarter to another quarter. I, I really disagree, disagree with that motion. Like I'm a big believer that modern selling is more so about buyer enablement. Like we're less salespeople, we're here to help that person on their buyer. Are there some things we can do mid cycle to accelerate? Heck yeah. But I, I also would be careful of those quarterly accelerators that you're getting the right types of deals that your company cares about, that, that are creative to the business and that aren't going to be long term disasters. And so that's where I, I also think this concept of a solution engineer or sales engineer, whatever you call them, is important that they gut check that deal, that there's some checklist, that they're meeting technical criteria, the, the solution criteria that you've set in the business. 
so that reps aren't um, artificially messing with that 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 quarterly acceleration process because it, it can happen. It's not likely to. People are always going to you know go towards I want this quarterly thing. I want it now. Um, but I have some seen I have seen reps slow down deals in order to try to get next quarter. We obviously want more money now is is better for the business, but it has to be the right set of deals. So um, as long as you have those checks and balances in, whether it's an SE or CS coming into the deal kind of pre-sales, um, that that handoff and ensuring you have the right type of deal probably will take out any any shenanigans in, in that in that quarterly rollover. Right. Awesome. Great. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming up. Uh, I'm going to ask one more from uh, Larry. Larry sent this question to me via message. Uh, Larry's asking, what is your thought on team selling? I'm a big fan of this and perhaps create a commission pool that can be shared. What are your thoughts, Stan and Patrick, on uh, team selling? Patrick, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan. So right now, I'm I am a frontline manager at, at Twilio. I actually really enjoy it. I've been I've been VP plus kind of level at other companies, and I enjoyed the, the, the level I'm at. So I don't have direct purvey over it at at Twilio, but I have in the past. I know like at Twilio today, our SEs do have a pool. So we have a number of SEs assigned to all of our AEs. They they are assigned a a, a pool of deals, so they help out as needed. Um, I, I think it's it's tremendously valuable. Um, one for uh, on, on the business side, you're, you're really smoothing out the, the enterprise risk of, of mishires and the right talent. You're matching talent in a better way. Uh, on the positive side, right, um, for the actual, for those SEs or wh whoever's doing that team selling um, to come in and, and, again, get the right deals. If it's a, if it's, you have BDRs or SDRs aligned with AEs, so on that, on that lead gen motion into, into new sales business, uh, I've also seen some really good, okay, how do we incent quantity and quality? Um, I don't know if you just have to do individual metrics there as well. There may be some MBO carve out 20% of your plan that you're assigning to say, okay, we're going to reward the SDR for bringing in a lead and qualifying it, whether it's BANT or insert favorite phrase that you want there. And then when it closes, we may give that person a kicker, or we may give the entire team a kicker when, when a certain threshold is met. Um, that may be better at a, at a startup to say, okay, if we hit our quarterly number and we did the right things we, we need to do, maybe augment some of those SDR sales metrics with a team-based incentive. I think there's a number of options you can do to create that team selling, whether it's pre or, or, or kind of post sales motions. Uh, Stan, any comments? Yeah, I, uh, I've, I'm fortunate to see a lot of plans uh, for, for based on what I do. Uh, and I, I, I do see a lot of different concepts and I think it does uh, vary. It's interesting because when you think about the, the, the comp or the industry that you're selling into or the industry that you're in and then who you're selling to. And then when you think about from the perspective of, uh, you know, what kind of uh, product or service you provide, it does all vary in terms of how a team concept would uh, be structured. But I'm, I am also very uh, in favor of creating some kind of an incentive structure. I traditionally, and in, in just in full disclosure, I, I do believe optimizing individual plans to make sure that they understand, you know, how to, to one, uh, they need to understand their plan. They know it needs to be optimized for a team concept. And I like the idea that Patrick shared, which is, you know, a BDR, if you think about their role, they're largely incentivized to drive meetings, right? Book meetings and, and quality meetings at that. Uh, and then the, if you create a, uh, a, a like a, a certain percentage on the back end, if closed, uh, they're incented to make sure that they're driving the quality and that promotes teams. So they're different. I like that approach. And that's what I've seen traditionally in a lot of the comp plans. But I have seen more of kind of a pod approach too. I have seen that more early stage where it is very team oriented. But eventually I've seen them kind of break out uh, into more of an individualized uh, kind of a contributor type plan. But I, I do think uh, just to, to tag one more thing, I have seen it in a larger organization be more kind of a, a pool, uh, maybe a, maybe not part of the plan per se, but just like a, they're trying to drive a, a thing or a behavior. And that's been maybe an extra pool of funds that the finance team, the sales leadership team aligned to and allocate at the discretion of the CRO, the VP of sales or whoever owns that particular department. Yeah. There's a couple of good ones here, Eduardo, if you want to call out. I, I like this gross profit margin and EBITDA factor in a percentage. I, I think that's maybe one where finance has to do and, and product works together to define the, the pricing and particularly what are the empowerment levels. So 
AEs can discount up to 15%. Managers can go to 20%. VP can go to 30%. But that's baked into the actual product margin that you have. Um, on, on a different take I, between Ray and Richard's questions here, um, Twilio actually just shifted shifted models. So we were doing full sales, or sorry, full full cycle sales for a while. So I was I had a book of business. I was also in charge of bringing in new logos within that territory. This year, and this is public knowledge, we've shifted to a gross profit model. So I'm actually my metrics now on my comp plan are total revenue and gross profit, um, which is different than profit margin. So we're actually trying to highly competitively crowd out the market to say we can bring in any deal as long as we're bringing in new dollars. It's really important to the business in some of our lower, more um, more commoditized products like like text messaging, as an example. But for more of our software products, we're still maintaining the margins that we need to be successful. So I, I think there's some ways you can or orchestrate a plan, uh, whether it's in the pricing of it or the empowerment levels, or if you shift completely from an MRR to an ARR model or from an ARR right now, like like we're on to a gross profit model, which is um, which is wildly different. So I know like people like Amazon Web Services and, and Twilio, and I think there's some other businesses out there now have shifted to total revenue and, and gross profit as some more creative ways to incentivize reps to go get new business and take that from competitors. But again, it it, it depends on the stage company of kind of where where you would insert those those creative metrics. Any thoughts there, Stan? Uh, I don't think anything additional on my side. Awesome. Uh, I think we have a question here in the Q&A uh, that came from Craig uh, a while ago, um, and it's basically about changes. So Patrick, you said like a Tulio uh, changed the, the, the strategy uh, midway. So Craig is asking, if you have a commission plan that pays out over two years um, consumables during that time period, but the commission plan changes after one year, what should happen to the commission currently in the two-year plan? Um, Stan, do you have any, any advice for Craig in there and how to navigate those changes in um, alignment with the company and also alignment with the commission plan overall? You know, honestly, I haven't, uh, I don't have the level of expertise, and I think this is a consumption question. Could be wrong. Uh, Patrick, if, if, if you have more expertise there, that might be part of a question for you, candidly. Yeah, so I mean, Twilio is like the darling product-led growth motion that for a while, our CEO, Jeff Lawson, said, do we really need sales reps? <laughs> Uh, and, and for a while, we didn't think we did. We, we obviously, we, we, we do. We have some very large logos spending tens of millions with us. Uh, we also have a great new business engine um, that farms developer communities and is, tries to get new logos. So I think I would say 101 of change management, be transparent about the changes. I would say over index on taking care of your, your salespeople. Um, I, I think there's some, there's some great stats on like, Outside of somebody's manager, the number one per reason a person leaves a company is, is going to be their 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 commission if they're a salesperson. And if, if, if again, feeling like it's wonky or there's shenanigans and there's things that aren't transparent about it, I think you're going to get some upset people. Um, you, you may have to pay again some sort of, if you're making a, a rapid shift, maybe you have to pay people a draw for a quarter. Maybe it's recoverable or not, but you have to kind of look at um, from an HR and, 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 a, and a CFO lens of like, okay, um, if, if I don't pay these people and they stay, is that really the type of culture we want? If I do pay these people and they leave, it's like that adage of training, like look at this from the perspective of taking care of your best talent. And if you're rewarding those people, but they're not seeing that immediacy of, of the plan, um, then, then you may have a motivation gap, right? So I would just be really careful with how you make that change. Um, and think of it more of a change management where you over index again on, on taking care of your best people and making sure they get paid. So it, it may be a short term burden to the company uh, financially to try to reward, uh, pay somebody their, their OTE, their on target earning for that period of time. But that may be the right move if you're pivoting and, and trying to reaccelerate the company in, in a new direction. Then you may have to you may have to do that. And that's a big pill to swallow from an executive team. Um, but I would say fight for your talent. If you've trained them, if you've hired them, the cost of hiring a brand new salesperson, getting them ramped up on another territory is probably greater than the output that you'd have in just paying somebody their commission for a few months to make them whole, right? Yeah, I, it's interesting. I, I saw a stat, uh, Spiff had a, a bunch of like 40 important stats for sales leaders. And the one that uh, stood out on that topic was 
Uh, 43% of salespeople would leave their organization for just a 10% change or increase in just salary. And I know you were just talking about a compensation adjustment. You know, just having, when, when you work in the commission automation space and you bring people in, you hear all the stories because their stories are then shared as to why they leave to uh, come to, to work at a company that does commission automation for, for a living, so to speak. And the, the stories that they share are pretty unbelievable, like overpaid, underpaid. And I think the thing that stood out to me the most when Patrick was talking is the over index and fighting for your people. Generally, if you do the right thing, the, the I've seen reps be fair and understand. And having that uh, communication, I think, is so critical. And I know we talked about alignment on the plans uh, in the beginning and having that uh, communication. Just maybe one layer more on that is when you deliver a plan, that, in my opinion, should be delivered by the sales leadership team. They need to understand the plan to be able to deliver the why, because ultimately the buyer journey that Patrick mentioned initially, I mean, everything should be around a customer focus. And if, if that's nailed down, you can, everything else typically would fall in line with that. And then when it comes to just the overall comp strategy, again, if, if, if there is, there's always going to be one offs and there's always going to be a misrepresentation or there's always going to be a, a challenge, but I just, over communication is, is, is something that's so critical in being able to help them understand the why. And then I love the fight for your team. And usually reps will pay that in dividends if you treat them right. Uh, and I think there are different stats uh, that are out there, but generally, you know, depending on your, your industry, your ROI on a rep happens after nine months for, for SMB and, and it's over 18 months for enterprise. So just it's really good, critical to take care of your people in a way where you're fair and they need to see that. And all that water cooler talk, it's, it's set up. Oh, my gosh. Can you believe they did that to me? It's going to be. Can you believe they did that for me? Right. And, and that will pay off in spades. And, and I mean. From a rep perspective, you better believe people are, are talking about their commissions. They're being transparent with one another. Like this isn't some secret where they don't know what others are getting paid. Like people pretty well know. And so m make sure you, you you take care of folks. And um, again, th that transparency concept is, is just key. Uh, we, we can go on there for a while, but yeah, let's pivot. Awesome. Uh, so I think we're talking about a lot about uh, retention. And I would like to ask you, Stan, you have like experience working in different sales environments and you have seen a lot of um, different sales uh, commissions plans out there. Um, what is like the main thing that a sales leader can look at to make sure that the sales compensation plans are retaining their talent, especially now with the economical environment that we are in. We are seeing a lot of people changing jobs and moving uh, careers. Uh, we also have a question in the chat from Richard, uh, like what about creative ways to make people stay and um, think about the commission as uh, this team build thing? Yeah. Uh, let me let me kind of give a, a ten thousand foot view response, and then maybe we can bring it back to Richard's question. Uh, I call it the triple T: transparency, transparency, transparency across everything. Like reps just need to understand how you philosophically treat commissions, and that starts from the very first interview. Like, and that's why I said at the beginning, as a business, as a leadership team, what is your comp strategy in general, and Promoting that, talking about it will attract talent. And then consistency with how your comp plan build is built throughout will help retain your talent. And if it's not transparent and if it's not visible, it's going to be hard and you're going to have more questions and there's going to be a lot more potential scrutiny on just generally how uh, the comp plan is driving uh, the right kind of outcome for the team, the individual, the organization. So when I, when I call it the triple T, it's just, transparency across the board. And that, to me, every company does it in a different way. And it, it doesn't have, you don't have to buy a, a commission automation platform. It does a lot, adds a lot of value. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, as long as you have your SLA in terms of how uh, finance and uh, the, 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 the commissionable uh, team, whether it's customer success, direct sales, partnerships, SDR teams, whomever uh, you're aligned to, as long as there's transparency on, how you engage and how you handle commissions and the SLA and turnaround on, on when it's when it's going to be available, when it's going to be uh, visible, and then how uh, the, the structure of the comp plan works. I think that all correlates and is really important. 
Yeah. On the creative side, uh, I, I, for, I already forgot the question, Edward. Remind me on the creative question Richard brought up. Just give me one second. Let me find it here. So Richard is asking, what are some creative ways you've seen to ensure reps are reaching quotas with a diversity of logos without capping their earning potentials too greatly? Let me share yeah, on this. I'm happy to jump in there, Stan, because I think the diversity of logos is the key point that maybe Richard's trying to get at. I don't know that. So I don't know that I would use a commission plan to let the tail wag the dog, like as, as that, that phrase goes, meaning that may be more of a revenue operations territory management piece where you may consider bifurcating your teams into mid market and enterprise reps. You may have different compensation plans based on on those paths to market if it's mid market enterprise. If everybody's getting all the all the different logos, I wouldn't necessarily use that to change your commission plan. Maybe that's more of a frontline management or VP level where they're directing their team to have a diversity in their own pipeline as a way to protect their earning potential, right? If I've got some baseball analogy, if I've got singles, doubles, and home runs in my pipeline, um, I want to I want to work each of those deals differently to close at different timing, and that's more of a more of a sales management pipeline management thing than it would be full on compensation. But again, if if you are moving to a path where you're bifurcating paths to market based on sales velocity metrics, meaning mid market closes a lot quicker, enterprise with those longer deals then you may have actually different commission rates or commissionable plans for those people. Uh, and that would be set by their, their, their quota. Maybe your mid-market rep is in charge of six or 700 K, whereas your enterprise is 1.2 to 1.6 million uh, in terms of what they're accountable for on an annual basis. Um, that's where you layer in. People are getting different percentage rates based on what their quotas are. And then that ties back to their OTE. But there's, there's a couple of things at play where I, I wouldn't say use your commission plan to direct how logos are being driven. Use your sales managers to direct how logos are being managed through the buying process. And then the output of that is maybe you change commission if you see some big some big uh, deltas in, in data and payout in those two different groups. I don't know, Stan, if, if that's hitting the, the root of the question there. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah I, think, I think you're on the right track. For, for me, uh, just as we, we changed and pivoted our, our overall strategy this year in terms of how we go to market. You're kind of a shotgun approach uh, and we moved to more of a rifle focus. And really to me, it's about what is what does good look like? Like when, when you talk about a diversity of logos, that should be pretty clear in my opinion on what you're going after in alignment with marketing uh, and whether you're using some kind of an, an algorithm or you've got um, you know the, the historical data be able to help you understand. And even if you don't have it right, at least you have a plan and then you can pivot based on what the data presents itself, based on the foundational elements you have in place. But you know, we when when we sit down with reps, it's here's your number. This is how you get there. This is the average sales cycle. This is what uh, an ICP looks like. And usually, if you can put those pieces in front uh, of of your team proactively, you'll generally see a, a positive outcome with the kind of logos that you're looking for. Uh, generally more directionally in, in the route that you're looking for. Um, and uh, you'll see, uh, you know, pretty, pretty good consistency with uh, the sales cycle and, and hopefully with the productivity and efficiency gains by having more uh, collaboration and uh, uniformity with that. It does drive down uh, time to, to, or the overall sales cycle. And then you see the, the overall selling price, have some consistency. In fact, it increases based on what you're trying to focus on. And so to me, diversity of logos is just focus uh, on what you want them to go after. If you can put that in front of them, it, it tends to drive the right outcome. Commission plan tied to the side. I see another one from Larry here, Eduardo, if you want to unpack this one. Have you ever heard of a recommended? Go ahead. Have you ever heard or recommend a commission plan tied to their salary, to their rep salary, uh, as opposed to a percentage of the sales? Mm -hmm. Sort of. I mean, I, I think I've heard this concept of a 5X rep in SaaS, meaning 5X of their OTE is a really good barometer. So if, if they're generating 5X in terms of ARR on, on, on 5X of their OTE into ARR, that may be a way to back into it as a, as a, and then that's where you set your, your percentages based off of that. You cascade back into it. Um, but again, like I said, er, for a, Smaller company who is Series B going to Series C. I, I again, I, I personally did 
move all my reps at one point to flat 10 percent. Uh, I think that was a short term fix to address the COVID market. I don't know long term that that's that that would be appropriate. Um, I think setting setting targets based on their salary is is an acceptable SaaS practice. Uh, and we should help hold people to that. Right. If um, because there's different geos baked in there, there's different um, there's different markets like like Stan was just talking about ideal customer profiles. If you've got two different ICPs, one's mid market, one's enterprise, it's perfectly acceptable to set those commission based on their salary because the salary is based on their quota and what they can get a lot of times. I, I, so I, I have seen that work just fine. Anything there, Stan? No, I, I think no. Patrick knows. Awesome. So we have nine minutes left. Uh, I'm, I want to touch on the last uh, topic that we had discussed before, which is about technology. So technology is changing. We have AI here. Uh, we have automation. Uh, Stan mentioned before that you don't need to buy the commission plan, but I think you should. And if you want to learn a little bit more about SPIF, there is a request button with our sponsor uh, at the top of this page. Um, so Stan, uh, what, what is the role of technology? look into this like plan for 2024, how can technology automate commission plans and how can it help people really um, be transparent and uh, hit the three T's that you mentioned before? Yeah, uh, well, thank you for the plug. Appreciate that. Uh, but when I think of when, are you, are you ready for automation is the question uh, that I often think about. You know, we have lots and lots of conversations with uh, with prospects that are, are simply looking to find a better path to alleviate the burden on the administrative side of it, drive transparency and visibility for the reps. Uh, and it's not just uh, only about, hey, what am I going to get paid out? It's about how, how did that, how did that, uh, that, that, uh, how did you calculate that? How, what was the formula that was used? What is, I don't understand that quite uh, on, on the way it was structured. And then there's the motivation side of it, which is, Hey, if I just do a little bit more. So as sales leaders, the one thing that uh, I certainly appreciate is just that the automation provides not just the transparency and you know how the payouts work, but it's also, hey, I'm close to accelerators. If I just do a little bit more, that could potentially put more money in my pocket. So it helps motivate reps to, to just do a little bit more. But before we can get there, my recommendation is I'll, I'm going to, uh, I've asked Eduardo on the team, there's a, a buyer's guide that we just rolled out that I think is just stellar. Tells exactly how you should be thinking about, am I ready for automation? Uh, highly recommend it. I think it'd be a good resource for anyone looking to uh, decision on whether or not it's time. But usually when I think about automation, can you optimize to it in a way where you can maximize the output? And what that means to me is, do we have a pretty good uh, concrete and uh, written plan? or set of plans. Uh, if they're, if it's tribal knowledge and it's in your head, you, you may not be ready for it. Uh, do you have good data hygiene? Mm. Uh, the biggest challenge with any automation is data. It's the biggest challenge, uh, honestly, is data hygiene. Uh, so if you, you'd be a good candidate, if you feel like you have good data integrity, and also these kinds of platforms help drive data integrity. So there's, there's a dual benefit with that. And then uh, just takes some time to set up and it would require subject matter experts with uh, the source data and it would require your time uh, those that are involved with the structure of the plans and then the build out but if it, if you're optimized uh in a way where you can take advantage of automation you should absolutely look at it uh, but again you don't need automation necessarily if you've got a certain structure where you've got a very good uh, partnership with the finance team or if the rev ops sales ops teams own it still partnership amongst uh, the organization, and that goes back to the alignment we talked about earlier, but who owns it, who owns the execution of it, and what are the SLAs? So reps know exactly what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. And when there's a window of time where they have questions, how are you going to deliver that? And are you timely in being able to answer those questions? So it's also just the overall execution and strategy, because if reps don't trust, uh, you're going to have a whole bigger set of problems. Uh, and that's when reps start leaving, when you mess with their commissions. And, and not just trust, but we just went through this uh, recently. Like if, if, if AEs are spending three or four hours every month to reconcile their own commissions, uh, where could they be better spending that, that time in rev revenue generating activities? And that's with a company who has a, a commission a system in place. Um, if, if it's not easy to understand and timely and actionable and there's a little lack of transparency, there's a number of factors, right? But if, if, if those reps, 
everybody's every rep is going to keep their own Excel sheet. They're going to have their customers in there. They're going to have their ARR. They know just about what they're getting paid. And if that matches what they're getting in their commission statement, cool. They're good with it. But the second it's off by you know a little bit, they're going to start to peel back and it's like, crap, where could they have better spent that time on going after those customer facing activities? And that's, that's where I would go to your, if, if, if you're a sales leader and you're having to kind of battle, I, I hate that, I hate that phrase. Cause you're all on the same damn team. You're at the same company. If you're having to battle them to say, we're wasting four hours a month, reconciling our comp statements. You, you have a bigger motivation issue that you need to go back and address. And that starts from that square one. Like Stan was saying, man, that, that, and, 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 and a commission thing, you know, no offense Stan to Spiff, but a commission system is not going to solve that problem. I think Stan has some great people on his team who can help you solve that problem and like enable you to get to there. And, 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 and that may be part of the benefit on its own, like whether you're moving from Excel to a system like Spiff, just getting that enablement and how to properly structure and motivate people may be worth the, the, the price of admission just on its own. Yeah. One quick anecdote to that. Uh, in a past uh, experience, I had four frontline managers and they each had six to eight reps. And this was a scenario where uh, a lot of us have heard the term shadow accounting, meaning uh, they have their CRM on the left and they have their Excel sheet on the right. And they're just waiting for that moment where that commission statement's going to hit. And at that time, it was very static. And we didn't know exactly when it was going to hit. We were on a monthly cadence. And I could tell you, I was walking the floor uh, the, the day or two after commissions hit. And I could just see all the reps manually putting in all their deals because we were fairly transactional. So it wasn't small. Um, and then there'd be some water cooler talk. And they were all asking the front line, hey, when is it going to hit? And when it did, we had four to eight hours. We just didn't know exactly within the first two weeks when it was going to happen. And I was calculating the lack of uh, the productivity loss there. And this was, I don't think this was too much of a stretch, but I kind of just like you would at the number. You have your number and you work backwards. How am I going to get there? Well, I, I, I went through the same approach. I went, all right, if I've got uh, 48 to 50 team members, including my time and my front leaders, time, front, man, front line managers time, uh, and, it, and I looked at it just from the perspective of, all right, if they're spending four to eight hours, four to eight hours, and probably four to be more conservative on a monthly basis. And if I just said, if I just spent that one hour out of the four prospecting, oh, gosh. and in that one hour, we get one opportunity and we have a 25% win rate. It was over a million dollars. Now it's a little fluffy. I agree. It's, it's just a number. But the loss of productivity is an absolute thing that we should be thinking about. And that goes back to transparency and visibility and having great alignment in SLA with those impacting commissions so that reps know exactly what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. I wouldn't say that's fluffy at all. That's that's concrete evidence there of here's our waterfall. Here's our sales math. Our sales velocity means we slow down sales velocity by this amount every month. What is the output of that? It's very calculable. So I, I think that's an ironclad way to have that discussion internally, Stan. Awesome. We are unfortunately running out of time. Um, that's a wrap on our deep dive into commissions. Uh, Patrick, Stan, thank you so much for all the knowledge you dropped on us today. That was fantastic. Just seeing like the audience participating. Uh, audience, you are amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today and for this great participation. Um, Again, I saw some people asking, the recording will be av available for you audience later today. You will receive all this knowledge on your uh, inbox. Isn't that amazing? You can have Patrick and Stan right in your inbox and you can hear their voices whenever you need. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, Audience, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Spiff, for uh, making this uh, this opportunity for us to learn a little bit more about commissions um, to create this opportunity for us. Uh, Stan, Patrick, thank you so much for the knowledge. Um, audience, I will see you around in our future MSP events, but the speakers and I will hang, guy, hang out backstage uh, now and talk a little bit on how we can get our commissions a little bit better. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. Uh, speakers, we can go backstage. Thanks, all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.